Hello, and thank you for joining the Caneberry Educational Conference at the 2021 Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. I'm Debbie Wexler, Executive Secretary for NARBA, the North American Raspberry and Blackberry Association, and I'll be the moderator for this session. I'd like to thank Wish Farms for sponsoring the Caneberry Educational Conference. Pesticide and CCA credits are available for most presentations offered during the live Southeast Regional Conference, though I'm not sure they are offered for this particular session. You can find out by checking the Pesticide CEU Guide for a list of approved presentations in participating states. And reminder that when pesticide credits are offered, they're only available for registered attendees and only during the live event. There's a simple three-step process to receive pesticide credits. First, you go to the audience chat box and type in your first name, last name, and the states that you want credits for. Then at the end of the session, you sign out at the end of the presentation, again, in the audience chat box. And then you complete the CEU registration, which you only have to do one time. This presentation is being pre-recorded. We'll be taking your questions live at the end of the session. And you can type your questions at any point during this presentation into the questions box and press send. Don't forget to thank all of our 2021 conference sponsors and exhibitors by visiting the virtual trade show and featured products pavilion. And don't forget to join us each morning for coffee chats and each evening for networking in receptions at five o'clock. Finally, I wanted to in mention one more thing. Uh, if you're interested in more Caneberry information, I invite you to join us at the North American Raspberry and Blackberry Conference, NARBA Zen Conference, which will be held in late February as a virtual conference and is preceded over the month of February by a seven session short course getting started in raspberries and blackberries. You can find out more and register at raspberryblackberry.com. The upcoming session is our grower spotlight, always a highlight of the Caneberry program. This year's farm is J. Calvert Farms in Coleman, Alabama, and our presenters will be Jeremy Calvert, owner of the farm, and Arnold Kaler, who started working with Jeremy a few years ago after retiring from his position as a research station superintendent with Auburn University. I look forward to learning about this very busy and diversified farm and how blackberries are becoming an important part of their operation. So take it away. Uh, hello, my name is Jeremy Calvert. Uh, I'm the owner of J. Calvert Farms. Uh, here to do a, a talk about, uh, tell you a little bit about our farm and, and what all we produce. Uh, we're mainly a uh, fruit and vegetable operation. Uh, we, we produce around 50 acres of fruits and vegetables. Uh, our top crops are uh, peaches, strawberries, tomatoes, and then pumpkins have have come a long ways in the last few years. And then Blackberry runs a, uh, has gotten to be a close number four for us. Uh, it's, uh, we're, we're a family operation. Uh, there's my wife and, and my son who's 17. My wife and I have been married 21 years. And we have a set of twin daughters that are uh, almost two and a half years old. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at the slide, you'll see a picture of my daughters there with me in the strawberry field. Uh, we started in uh, 98. Uh, as, like I said, we've, we're diversified. We grow a wide range of crops. Uh, and I've already told you a little bit about our, uh, our acreage, but most of our crops, are we, 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 do, we do our best to sell all we can retail. That's our main goal. Uh, we, we own our own retail store uh, about seven miles from our main farm. And then we also sell at a couple of local farmers markets, but uh, the vast majority of it goes through our store. Uh, we started we started out with uh, Irish red potatoes. That was the first thing my wife and I did in the late nineties. Uh, it was really good to us uh, for several years. Uh, we also had poultry houses. Uh, that was one thing most of my family did. We were all in commercial broilers at the time. 
And uh, we began to see the handwriting on the rock wall with uh, wholesale production, or at least wholesale production for a farm our size. And where we're at, the uh, fields are not as big, it's hilly, and, and uh, we just don't, there's just not much opportunity there for large scale wholesale production. So in about 02 or so, we started more tra making a transition more to retail, started selling at some local farmers markets. And then we started growing strawberries in about 05. And we started out with 6,000 plants. Uh, my wife and I harvested all of them. Uh, well, we, we, we really didn't hire a whole lot of labor at that time. We pretty well did everything. Uh, and, then in, and then in a few years, we, we grew, grew into more fruits and vegetables. We'd always grown a few tomatoes, uh, some squash and cucumbers, but nothing compared to what we do now. And then in about uh, 06 or so, somewhere in that neighborhood, we set out our first fruit trees. Uh, we set out, we started a peach orchard and that was kind of a, a kind of a big adventure for us because we had always been told that we couldn't grow peaches where we're at. And, uh, Nobody ever really tried it where we were at in our in our community. So we expanded into that. It's it's done well for us. And then uh, fast forward a few years later, and about uh, fifteen or sixteen, somewhere in that neighborhood, we opened up our own farm store and we got out of the poultry business. Uh, and the operations just continued to grow. Uh, we we tried our first blackberries in uh, two thousand sixteen. And uh, we had uh, seven different varieties. Seven. Seven, seven different varieties. Uh, we had uh, Wachita, uh, Freedom, uh, Natchez, Traveler, Black Osage, and uh, Rapaho, Rapaho, and Vaughn. Vaughn. We, had, we, had, we, we had all of those in production so we could kind of see what worked best for us. And... Uh, we increased our blackberry production in 2019. We set out another uh, big section of blackberries. We set out uh, Freedom, uh, Sweetie Pie, uh, Natchez, Cato. Uh, Cato. We set out some. Uh, well, the Cato oh. came in 2020, yeah. but in 2019 we set out uh, Sweetie Pie and uh, Osage. Osage. Wachita. We, we didn't set out any travelers. We set out Natchez. Uh, we had Natchez in it, and it was and Chester. Uh, Chester was the other one that we set out. We kind of cut back on some of the varieties. We we weeded out some. We didn't we didn't plant any more Vons or uh, Black Osage. And, uh, and and the thought process behind this is when Jeremy and I discussed it was that uh, we were trying to extend the season for as long as possible because he is a, a retail market, and this is why we included, for instance, Chester. It's it's a typically a very late berry um, and so we were just interested in extending the season that's also why we have freedom in there because freedom is about produce comes ripe about three weeks earlier than any of the other cultivars so we actually have overlap of strawberries peaches and blackberries all at the same time but that that allows us to get on the market when nobody else is on the market and also in our area, Jeremy is is probably the only, is the only one that's producing blackberries on a commercial basis, and and we he's it's really small right now. It's only about an acre, and so uh, it's just a, been a good fit for him. By the way, this is Arnold Kaler. Yeah. I failed to introduce him. Uh, Debbie introduced him in the introduction, but Arnold was a superintendent of the local experiment station, and then when he retired, we were fortunate enough that he came to to work for us. I'm flunky. <laughs> <laughs> he uses that term very loosely. Uh, he's by far from a flunky, but uh, he really helped us get into blackberry production. And uh, it's been a good thing for our business, especially the, the, the last year. Uh, I think most of us in the fruit and vegetable industry, uh, it, it, we're in the retail side of things anyway, could say that we had a, a really good year uh, throughout all the virus. Uh, that can be for another talk, but uh, Blackberry sold really well for us this past year. Uh, here's a slide that tells a little bit about some of the crops we grow that I've already discussed. Uh, strawberries, peaches, and blackberries, tomatoes, squash, peppers, watermelons, cantaloupes. 
musket irons are new to us. We just we're just getting started in that, and we're just in it going to be it in a small way. But it's what, what we're trying to do with musket irons is is uh, we're looking for something to get us between uh, the end of peaches and the start of, of pumpkins. We've got about a two or three week window there where we don't have any kind of fruit to mount to anything to draw anybody. And that's also some of the effort with the green peanuts. Uh, we're trying to fill a gap uh, when we run out of peaches to, to get us to pumpkin time. Uh, beans and peas and of course sweet corn. And then this year we did something a little bit different. Uh, I, 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 grew some field corn just for the, to sell to the deer hunters. But, you know, we, we sell to anybody that's got, um, that wants it as far as that goes. But Alabama, state of Alabama changed the game laws a couple of years ago where now it's legal to hunt over bait. And uh, th that's been some decent wintertime money for us. And, and that's the whole goal behind that. that that's about all that is. Uh, we got a slide here that shows some of the crew that, that I use. Of course, they're, if you can see it, they're holding my, my daughters. We'd, we'd carried them out to eat right before they went back to Mexico. But uh, there's no question we couldn't do what we do without uh, good dependable labor. We're on the H-2A program. We're going into our fifth year in H-2A. And uh, there's no way I would go back. Uh, it's, it's, it's been what, what has allowed us to grow and, and allowed us to and allowed me to sleep a whole lot better. I have, I have good, dependable, legal labor. Uh, this is a picture of strawberries. Uh, we're up to, as I said before, we started out with about 6,000 plants and harvesting them ourselves, And uh, now we're up to about 30,000. And uh, we, uh, well, like I said, we retail, I'd say 70 to 90% of all of our berries. Uh, we do our best not to wholesale any, if at all possible, but if you've been in the fruit and vegetable business very long, sooner or later, in order to have enough, you've got to have too much, and you wind up having to wholesale some, but but that's not our goal. Uh, we're we're big on cover crops ahead of strawberries. We, we're big on rotation, and we try to do that with all our crops. And strawberries is... Your bed and butter. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's it's the top of what we do. It's it's been really good for us. Here's uh, some peaches. Uh, I can't remember what variety that is right off the top of my head. I don't think it's flavor rich. I wanted to say it was. I actually think it's probably Crest Haven. But uh, peaches have been a good thing for us. It was a little bit unique where we're at. We kind of had to train our customers to buy peaches because. And in other peach producing areas in the state, uh, when when peach season gets around, customers are just they were looking for peaches. They 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 cook with them, they use them. Well, in our particular area, the only time anybody ever ate a peach is when they went somewhere to get some, which is at least an hour away or or more. And and it's kind of had been a developing market for us, but it, it's it's turned out to be a good thing for us as well. Uh, I, we failed to do this, but. Coleman is located in the northern part of the state, and we're approximately 45 miles from Birmingham and 45 miles from Huntsville, which are two big metropolitan areas. And uh, Jeremy had mentioned this year at his farm market about the, the virus, how it affected it. And he had quite a bit of business this year that came up from Birmingham and, and probably some from Huntsville also. So. We're, we're in a good area and our, our area is actually growing because of industries in our county and plus the growth of Huntsville itself, the defense industry, uh, FBI and that type of stuff. And not only that, we're surrounded by Lewis Smith Lake. If you look it up on the internet, it's uh, second cleanest lake in the United States. And, and there's a large, uh, there's not only a large uh, community of people that live on the lake full time, but there's a large, uh, a large influx of people during the summer months who visit uh, the lake. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Freedom, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, uh, this this blackberry, uh, you know, Arnold and I've been we were back and forth on this blackberry early on because I had it four years before we set these out. We had a, we had another planting of it and. To begin with, we couldn't manage the canes. We, we were struggling to figure out what was going on because we wouldn't get any fall production and the canes would die back and like the berry, but we had a hard time figuring out what to do. And we think we're on the 
kind of over the hump on figuring out how to manage the canes. But this particular blackberry here, the, uh, there were 72 plants of this blackberry and uh, this is its second year. It was planted uh, uh, in, let's see, be 2019. Mm -hmm. So we would harvest it in 2020. Now I will admit uh, I babied them, I took care of them. Uh, I irrigated them all year long because we had a dry spell in 2019 late in the year. And uh, I really, we got a lot of good cane growth that first year. And for whatever reason, if the winter wasn't cold enough or what, they never truly went dormant. Uh, they never lost all their leaves. But in 2020, those 72 plants produced over 200 gallon of, straw, of uh, blackberries. And uh, I mean, I picked them, but it's still kind of mind boggling the production that came off of them. Uh, and, and we'll and we'll go into some of the issues that we've had with freedom in in just a little bit when we go over his blackberries. But uh, there was some. There's been a, some a learning curve, but I'm gonna just let him continue to show you what we've got on his farm there. This is uh, just a, a, a small display of some of our pumpkins. Uh, we, we've gotten to the point where we grow a lot of pumpkins. It's one of the crops that we do wholesale a fair amount of. We sell a lot of pumpkins wholesale and we sell a lot retail there at our store, uh, but we, we grow a lot. This is just a, a picture of some of our stuff at one of the local farmer's markets. Uh, this is early in the year because we're still picking strawberries, but right now you can see we're picking peaches, strawberries, and blackberries all at the same time. And, and that's a good combination. We have had it to where we, we, we were fortunate enough, we had a warmer spring and we were picking tomatoes all at the same time. And you know, that's a, that's a really good combination to draw customers when you can get all of that at the same time. Uh, just another display of, of, of our store. This is, this is this year when we went to more of a drive-through type uh, situation at our store. The way, we, the way that our store is built We've got a big front porch or big side porches all the way around it, which allowed us to have uh, drive-through service. And uh, uh, some some customers loved it. the majority. Well, let me put it this way: the majority of the customers loved it. Uh, you get a few people who didn't like it because they want to get out and touch their vegetables and squeeze them. You know, for those of us who sell fruit and vegetables, we know how that is. But uh, as a general rule, it was a positive thing for our business. Uh, it, it really worked well for us and, and probably brought us more customers than we've ever had because of that. Here's some more blackberries. This is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is either Natchez or- uh, That's Natchez. Yeah, that's what I thought. I think that's Natchez there. Uh, we don't, I don't have the individual numbers by variety on Natchez. Uh, like I told you earlier, I did on Freedom because I picked most of the Freedoms by myself. And so I kept up with it uh, because, and one of the reasons Freedom so much earlier than everything else, it was easy to separate it out. But Natchez has been a good blackberry for us. It's big. Uh, we didn't have much white droplet in it and uh, it worked really well. One thing I wouldn't mention before we forget it, uh, these rows that you're looking at are running east and west. And uh, previously we'd had some running north and south and had some from different years, we'd have a little bit of white droplet issue. Uh, we had talked to a, a friend of ours who said that he had thought he saw less white droplet when they were running east and west. And I can't tell any difference. Uh, yeah. we, we saw no benefit of it uh, yeah. one way or the other. Yeah, we've got them going both ways and you see equal amounts of droplets. A lot of it's uh, cultivar dependent on how much you see or don't see. And we'll go over that. We've got something about the diseases and disorders that we've had problems with, but probably what we'll do now is just Jeremy and I can talk about, talk to you about his production practice, what, what he did, what, what we learned, what we, where we've had problems or any kind of issue or anything like that. And Jeremy is a very good farmer and pays attention to the P's and Q's and try to do it to do everything right when it needs to be done. And that's that's the key to success is doing what you need to do and doing it in a timely manner. Um, and so what we're gonna start out with is, uh, Jeremy, this is for anybody. You take 
a soil test and you adjust your pH according to that soil test. And then we fertilize yeah, uh, we put, based on, uh, on our pre-plant fertilizer before we ever planted plants based on a soil test. And then- uh, I would say one thing that, uh, that uh, you probably would need to know because this was close to my orchard and we had really heavily limed the orchard because you know you get to a point where you can't get a truck down through the trees anymore. pH was up close to a seven when we started. So we, we were a little bit on the high side, but our, our soil, you can put a ton to the acre of lime every year and it, it doesn't hurt a thing. We're typically acidic. And, and it's a perennial crop. So you, you, you know, you only, you really get the chance to adjust your pH correctly at, at up front. So this is what we do. Um, when we got, when we ordered our plants, we used a company called AgriStarts and who sell tissue culture plants. They produce a good plant, you know, and, and that's, to me, that's the benefit of anything is if you're gonna, your crop's only gonna be as good as the seed that you start with. And so same includes plants, the better the plant, the better growth you get and the better crop you're gonna produce. If, yeah. if they cost more, you're, so what? Pay the price and get good plants because yeah. it doesn't pay to start with bad plants. Everything's drip ir on drip irrigation. Use it for watering and also fertigation. Uh, and like Jer Jeremy mentioned, the year we established these, we were in a drought year. And uh, the amount, we just really poured the water to it. And uh, But the amount of growth that we got was phenomenal and you know it just pays pays to do it I, I would say on as far as irrigation and and being able to irrigate them throughout a drought like that uh, these particular ones uh, we've set them up on a uh, dc valves with a small type computer that the, that the watering comes on automatically and that in my opinion that's a key to a man that's got a lot going on because what happens is you, you forget to turn the water on and off. And the first thing you know, you miss two or three irrigations. And with, with those those computers, they work really well for us. And also irrigates usually in, in a, when it needs the irrigation, you'll typically irrigate twice daily, uh, you know, run or at, night. or at night, you know, just run the system for an hour or two and then let it shut off and then wait three or four hours and then come back. Uh, you get what better, water movement through the soil by doing that, I think. So that's, that's his typical schedule. And then we put, uh, inject calcium nitrate, mm -hmm. uh, usually once a week during the growing season, just keep those plants vigorous and growing good. Um, we can both mention the, the mulches we used. Uh, first year when Jeremy increased his acreage. Uh, we used black um, biodegradable mulch and uh, white uh, the white white. I'm sorry, white biodegradable mulch, and to get them established. And, and this worked great, but in hindsight, we should have used the black ground cover mat that they use in nurseries. That's that worked out much better. Now the the biodegradable worked great and it did did its job and it we even still had some out there in the second year and that's to me to us that's the main benefit of using these mulches is that you cut down on your weed competition and you get these plants off to a good growth yeah you you stop a, one of our big issues with a perennial plant like this is morning glories and in the hot part of the summertime you just kind of eliminate most of those as long as you can keep it mowed around the mulch or whatever. The, the next one we plant this spring, we're going to use a black ground cover and we're going to lay it with a plastic layer. Like we, we did it on our muscadines and it worked really well. And, and in my opinion, uh, that's, that's the way we'll do all ours from now on. But the biodegradable plastic did its job. It's just that it, we, what we had to do was we had to go back and put ground cover on top of that after it degrades. And so why not just do it all to begin with? And we had to put it on both sides that way. We used three, it was three feet wide and we put put it on each side of the row. Whereas uh, when we lay it with the plastic layer, we used uh, four feet four wide feet. Uh, and 
install the drip irrigation underneath it. And that works out much better. And plus you're on a bed, which makes, produces better growth from the plant. Um, we learned a few things about trellis uh, and actually learned it from the Savannah meeting last year uh, from Dave Lockwood and Gina Fernandez with, with their talks about trellising systems. Uh, we, we have them on a trellis, but we, we use a single wire trellis and we also keep them up sort of like we would tomatoes basically using a Florida weave and just bunch everything together. Um, but this year, Jeremy and I have talked, and after seeing that talk, we're converting everything over to a tea trellis. We think it'll be just much easier to manage our primocanes. The issue we have is it's not that the the, the tie and the blackberries look like a tomato plant. It's not that it doesn't work. What happens is, is right in the middle of harvest, you've got new canes putting up and you're busy with harvest and, and you need to be tying canes all at the same time. And the next thing you know, you get a strong wind and you wind up losing some canes. And if we were in a tea trellis, we wouldn't really have that issue because the the scaff of the trellising is there to, to catch the canes, you know, and that that's our main issue with it. it, it that we're trying to to stop from losing some some really nice canes we just get it doesn't matter how much help you've got it seems like there's never enough time to get back in time when you need to tie them and and several of these cultivars are so vigorous that uh, they just produce so much growth that they when in a single wire light system like this we get so much growth that it's interferes with pick harvesting a little bit and it just makes it a little bit more aggravating doing the harvest and uh, some of them for instance um, freedom primark, primark freedom which is a primocane bearing plant the, the it has it's very vigorous and it produces very stiff canes that are easy to break uh, it's more so than all the other cultivars that we've grown and uh, we just think Converting it over to a tea trellis is going to make life a whole lot easier on us. Now we do use primocane management. Uh, we we tip everything to promote lateral branching. Uh, that that way we can get as much fruiting surface as we can. And we try to pinch it at the soft stage, but uh, to reduce diseases. And it's it really doesn't take all that long to just walk through there. Um, we do well, some while we're picking. We do some while we're picking, and and one of the things we'll mention is, I I, pre, I made a presentation before this about the cultivars that Jeremy has at the farm, and uh, Jeremy alluded to it when he talked about Primark Freedom, and we we weren't accustomed to growing uh, a primocane fruiting berry. For us, it typically is just we get too hot and so we're not really after the primocane crop we're after that fluorocane crop and we trying to figure out how to manage that primocane to keep it from flowering and, and keep it growing vegetatively so that it doesn't die on us and, and and as i mentioned with it it's so vigorous that one of the things that we did this year we we got i got the bright idea of doing primocane suppression to just kind of cut it out completely. And that that worked good for all of the cultivars except Freedom. Freedom didn't like it and uh, we're not gonna have the production that we had this year because by doing that, we, we reduced the amount of primocane growth that we had or, or could have had. And so we're, we're, just, we're learning about these primocane varieties uh, and we think that this year we got it, but <laughs> we we'll, think, we think, and the thinking is dangerous for me. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll find that the jury's out on that deal. Um, but here's some of the cultivar responses to tipping. Um, it's on my left without the mule behind it. That snatch is where we tipped it back. And you can see down at the base of the plant, we've got good lateral branching. We also got good lateral branching up at the top. Um, 
compared to the one where you see the mule in the background, that's prime art freedom. You can see we don't have as much lateral branching as what we would like to have. And that's just strictly from the point of uh, that primocaine suppression that we did earlier. Yeah, it, it just does not like to have everything cut out. It, it just doesn't like that. But, but freedom is a very stiff cane and it breaks very easily. So you, you need to handle it sort of with the kid gloves. Everything else, I think, had pretty good uh, growth. Uh, Natchez and Cato, they they have really good a really good growth habit and and they're easy to train. We we planted Ponca. We uh, didn't get the plants early enough to fruit this year, but that one's I think is also going to be one that's fairly easy to manage. And we uh, one other mistake I made on Ponca is whatever reason, lack of time or whatever, we didn't put it on a bed like we did some of the others. And as far as I'm concerned, all of mine from now on will be, be put on a bed with a, with like a rain flow plastic layer. Uh, it, they just, they seem to just do so much better. They, they do. They do a lot, lot better. And, and Jeremy's goal is, is like, like he's mentioned, um, you know, it, it's retail market. And so everything's about, quality and um we'll just at the end of the talk here we'll sort of go over some of the varieties that we had and, and some of the pluses and minuses that we saw with them but uh everything that we can do to make it easier and, and get that good growth is is what we're after and so with disease management um there's not a history and jeremy there's Really, one of the first things you do whenever you do grow blackberries, as many of you know, is you try to eradicate as many of the wild blackberries to eliminate viruses and other diseases. And Jeremy's fortunate where he's at that there's not many growing around him, so we didn't have to have that problem. And um, we, he and I both scout for disease development and. If we see a problem, then we'll spray as needed. Uh, mentioned that we pinch our, our lateral, our, our, I mean our primer canes to promote laterals at the soft tip. And that's to reduce the cane blight because you typically get more cane blight when you prune. Uh, we put on a, a dormant spray of lime sulfur uh, for anthracnose. And other than that, we just really haven't had much of a disease issue. Uh, we have very little botrytis, you know, yeah. just don't have it. One other thing I would say for anybody who's considering to grow in blackberries and they may already go strawberries, a friend of mine and Arnold both, uh, he grows uh, some thorny Kiowas is what he grows. But he told me sometime back, as a general rule, when, you know, for those of us who retail blackberries, we don't have a whole lot of, of acreage. So when we spray our strawberries in the spring, we just you've usually got enough left in the tank and it's the same chemicals work for both strawberries and blackberries and you can go ahead and hit the blackberries too. Yeah. And so I think that really helps a lot. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the materials that he uses on, on strawberries are labeled for blackberries and so it just makes it a easy transition to go in there and, and spray and uh, that's probably helping us with our disease issues. Plus typically up here where we're at, uh, and especially since John's come out with these new thorny cultivars, uh, double blossom or rosette just doesn't seem to be an issue for us. Uh, and we don't, we've never seen any orange rust. So, and we've never had Navajo, so we don't really expect to see it, but we keep an eye out for it. We did see this, this season, we saw some uh, leaf rust and that's, that's the first time I'd ever seen it live and in person and uh we sprayed it with a uh, recommended fungicide about twice and it just it basically just went away after that so and i, I credit to this to a humid very wet and humid summer and a lot of plant material there that yeah. they just they couldn't dry out very often and i think that really amplified it the amount of growth we had was just it was really amazing this year and and this was almost a perfect growing season for us this year. We had rainfall 
at times when we need it, basically almost every week during the whole growing season. I mean, you, you could have not have asked for a, a better situation. Uh, floor cane management after the harvest, we, we go in there and uh, take the old floor canes out. So we get plenty of room for the new prime canes to develop. And you hear both sides of the story on that. You know, some people say you leave it in the winter and some say you don't. I just, it's my personal opinion that if I can get that out of the way in the summertime, I'm better off because I'm just going to get better growth out of the plant and I can train the plant like we, like it needs to be trained during the summertime. And it's a hot job because you're up in there and it's, 80, 90 degrees, and there's no breeze blowing in there. But, you know, it's, I think in the long run, it just pays off. And we also think the tea trailers will make this job easier. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot easier. The, the, when you when you time like we have with like you would a tomato crop, it, it, it makes pruning out the old canes more difficult. There's no doubt yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, the insects, uh, here again, you know, you, you just scout and spray what's recommended when it's needed. Uh, you know, either Jeremy or I are constantly out there literally every day and, and looking at what's going on in the crop. And that's, that's what you need to be doing, or I feel like you need to be doing is, is be out there in that crop so you can see any problems when they first start to develop and that way you, you're on top of it and you can take care of it and and fortunately where jeremy's at and we we just are blessed to not have a lot of problems with uh, a lot of insects i'm gonna say japanese beetles are to a degree some problem but they're not not really they're easy to control stink bugs are probably the biggest issue that we have um we had sweetie pie, and we'll go over cultivars here in just a little bit, but uh, sweetie pie was the only one that had mites on it. And, uh, so we, but we do scout for mites because there's such a problem in strawberries. We're just accustomed to, to looking for that insect and uh, pay attention to it because it's an insect that can get out of control and get, you can get in trouble in a hurry. Our, our standard saying is if you find a mite, you don't walk to get the sprayer, you run to get the sprayer. That's right. You want to, you want it out of there as quick as possible. And here again, we're, we're just very fortunate and, and, and blessed that uh, spotted winged syphilis is, is not much of an issue for us. And we're, we're thankful for that because I know we're in other areas of the country that this guy is a nightmare. And we just we just really haven't noticed the problem with it. We keep the fruit picked very close. We pick at least three to four times a week, uh, and it's just because of the demand for for the crop. And I, I think that's a key to it is um, harvesting on a timely basis and keeping it picked fairly close. And then there again, just going out there and just being with the crop and noticing what's going on. Will, will help you out considerably. A good timely harvest stops a lot of problems. That, that's correct. Uh, and and we we'll go to fruit disorders. Uh, white droplets been the main main problem, and you know it's it's, it's sort of hit or miss with us. Um, like we mentioned, the the row orientation didn't seem to matter, and and shade cloth, we tried shade cloth. Sweetie pie hat was the worst cultivar that we had with a uh, white droplet. And uh, we tried shade cloth on it and that didn't help. And uh, Jer Jeremy's pretty ruthless and I'm, I'm pretty ruthless also when it comes to making decisions on who needs to stay and who needs to go. <laughs> and uh, Sweetie pie went out the window because Sweetie pie just had so many issues with it. And also the quality of sweetie pie was excellent. But the problem with sweetie pie was that it's a softer berry. And but we felt like with a retail market we could that wasn't going to be an issue with us. But 
if it rained or even thought about raining, that sweetie pie just went out the window and you had to go through the back. You'd have to go through the baskets that you pick, get all the bad ones out. And we finally just stopped picking it. Now, sweetie pie, Jeremy and I both thought it might be a cultivar if, if you want to do it on a small acreage for retail market, might be okay in a in a high tunnel. But you got so many others from John's program that are just quality so good that there's no reason to have to put up with that. Yeah, and if you did try it in a high tunnel, mites are going to be an issue. For whatever <laughs> reason, mites love that variety of, of blackberry, and it didn't really attack anything else. Yeah. I, and I mean, we had varieties that were touching sweetie pie in row, and they still didn't get on anything but sweetie pie. Yeah, it's it's kind of like in strawberry. For anybody familiar with strawberries, you use Albion as a trap crop for mites <laughs> because if there's one around, they're going to go to Albion. And I think sweetie pie is like that for blackberries. The other thing I would say about sweetie pie was production was not the issue. It had a lot of berries there. They just weren't marketable. Yeah, and they were large berries. They were large. They were large and they were good. And then it had his very vigorous plant. It's just too hard to manage. Um, I'm going to back up. We're about through with our talk, but uh, we'll just quickly go over some of our thoughts with the cultivars that we've grown and uh, the first one that we pick is Prime Art Freedom. And the main thing is it's three weeks earlier than everything else. Yeah, you're almost done with it before We're, you start in anything else. And, and so we, we just get on the market with before anybody else does. And the berry is a, it's a large berry for us. And, and in most years, it's, quality is, is pretty good. It's, it's not as good as Cato or maybe Osage, but it's it's still a fairly decent berry. And so And when we say when we're talking about quality, we really mean taste. Yeah. For our retail operation, we don't have any problem with it holding up and long enough to sell it. That that's not an issue for us. But the taste is is it's it can not hardly be as good as the others, but you're so much earlier than everything else, that's kind of really insignificant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Jeremy mentioned it in, in his situation usually within two days that berry is in somebody's refrigerator at home and that that's about as long a period of time as as he carries the berries over so you know that we can get away with some softer fruit than what the commercial you commercial guys have and you, where you we're not worried about shipping them anywhere or hold them in for a week or so like that so that, that's freedom and then after freedom we go to natchez uh we like natchez natchez is a very large berry and good taste, good taste and, and very productive and with both of these cultivars seed size is not really too big it's not objectionable and then after natchez we start with osage and osage is more of a round berry but it's still fairly a good sized berry good taste and it's got very good taste uh and then we have some overlap with natchez and osage and then in the middle of the osage harvest we start harvesting washita and washita is a good berry but a lot of maybe the first two to three pickings maybe the four we'll see some white droplet but it's not very it's usually not very bad no it's, it's nothing like sweetie pie and, but it's next in line on white droplet and, and after about four harvests it just goes away for, for whatever reason uh, we after about that fourth harvest we just don't see it anymore uh, and then after the washita we had cato this year and cato we cato's a nice berry it's a it's a big berry. Quality is excellent. This is this is good as sweetie pie, in our opinion. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, way, way, uh, <laughs> I'm partial to it. Yeah, and and uh, it, it's just a good berry, and we we're actually going to Jeremy's going to expand his blackberry production this coming year, and and Cato is going to be one of the ones that we included in that. And the other thing about Cato is that. We didn't realize it at the time is that Cato tends to ripen later in the season. 
And that was the reason we had Chester in there was for late berries. And Chester is, is a vigorous plant and it produces a lot of fruit, but the, the, the fruit's not as large. It's difficult to pick that calyx, the, the, the the cap, it doesn't want to separate very easy, so you you're it's a little it takes a little bit more effort to, to harvest it. But you wind up bruising the fruit. You, yeah, you care. bruise the fruit, and uh, quality is is pretty decent. It's not not as good as Cato, and so here again, we we decided that since Cato was so late that we can do without Chester. Yeah, the, and and so Chester's out the door this year also one other big problem with chester is it wants to grow flat i mean it it, it put, makes long trailing canes and it, it wants to grow just as flat as it can on the ground and and they're so it's so vigorous and there's so much of it it's kind of hard to manage really because it's so late in the season you're still working with those canes and you hadn't even started picking yet right. you know that's kind of a problem kato one other thing i'd say about it arnold and i both noticed it's got a stiffer cane it's more towards freedom and stiffness of the cane, but not nearly as brittle as freedom. Yeah. Or our, our, our freedom will just snap over if it doesn't have some support. Cato's not quite that bad, but it is a stiffer cane. If you look at freedom just right, it'll break on you and lay down. Whereas uh, to me, Cato had a very good plant structure and very good lateral uh, branch development. It's just, a, to me, it's a, a good plant to have. Another one, we didn't get to fruit it this year, but we we have high expectations out of it is Ponca. And, uh, you know, we, we, everything we got pretty much comes from John Clark's uh, program out of Arkansas, University of Arkansas. And, uh, you know, when I think when John says it's the best, I, I kind of take him at his word and, uh, okay. And we just got told that we got one minute, so, and we're pretty much through. We're just rambling on right now. But uh, anyway, we'll leave it at that. And I'm thankful to Jeremy for letting me work for him because uh, <laughs> he, he lets me keep banker hours. <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better boss. <laughs> well, what I would say to, to that is uh, Arnold's been a researcher most all his life, and he still is. Whatever he wants to do, we do it. And mm -hmm. he, he He's been a really big help to our farm. He's been good for us. And I think that on any operation is is try different things just to see what works and what doesn't work. And it, just don't do it on a big scale when you first start out. But with that, we'll, we'll sit down and shut up and uh, answer any questions if we can. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, thank you for your time.